everyone worships. Everyone has someone or something that they depend on, that they value, that they treasure above all else. Everyone has someone or something that they treat as God. In fact, a lot of people have multiple things that they treat as God. Things they idolize, you might say. But for the Christian, there can be only one God. The true and living God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We can treat no one or nothing else as if it were God. Only God must hold the place of God for the believer. We're continuing our series, Stories We Know to Help Us Grow. Today we look at the three Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel chapter 3. The Israelite people sinned greatly against God. They broke their covenant with God over centuries. And God finally did what he told them he was going to do. They were overthrown by Babylon, whose king was Nebuchadnezzar. And they were taken captive into Babylon. Some of the leading men of the Jews were trained by Nebuchadnezzar to serve in his court. Among those men were Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Daniel's name was changed to Belshazzar, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. We know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three men won God's favor in the court of the king. God prospered them. But we come to an event in Daniel chapter 3 that threatens to change all of that. Threatens to change the standing of these Hebrew men in the court of Babylon. This morning we are going to talk about the pressure that we face as Christians. The pressure to idolize and worship things other than God. The pressure we face to treat other things as if they were God. And we're also going to talk about how it is that we should respond to that pressure. So as we begin to look at this story, this is the first thing that I would have you to notice. God's people are pressured to worship false gods. God's people are pressured to worship false gods. Please look at verse 1 of Daniel 3. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits, and its width 60 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. A golden statue. 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. Solid gold. The king's command we see in verses 3 through 5. Look there with me. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, all the rulers of all the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. They stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had stood up, had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, To you the command is given, O peoples, nations of men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. So the command of the king, he built this statue. By the way, 
the statue is largely believed to, to be an image of himself, a representation of himself. And he commands all the people of all of the lands that he has conquered. When you hear the sound of the music, you bow down and worship the image. In other words, what he's telling the people to do, you are to treat this statue, which represents Nebuchadnezzar, as God. Worship it like it was God. And he threatens dire consequences should the people refuse. Verse 6, whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Now this is not just peer pressure. For you and I, when we're pressured to, to treat other things as God, a lot of times it's peer pressure. But this is not peer pressure. This is a threat of life. Dire consequences. This is serious business. If you will not worship this God, you will die. Verse 7. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations of men of every language fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Of course they did. They've been threatened with their life. They have to treat this statue, this image of gold, as if it were God. They are pressured to do so, and they do so. For God's people, this is a violation of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. And the second commandment, not to worship any image, any idol. The very first two commandments are violated in bowing to this false God. Now, our society has many, many, many gods. Sports can be an idol. You believe that? There are people who commit more of their time and more of their money to sports than they do to God. I have known many Christian families who would take their children all over the place to play ball on Sundays and would gladly skip church to do so. When you do that, you have elevated sports to a place above God. In our society, sex is an idol. Because people think that sex is the ultimate fulfillment and pleasure. Rather than looking to God to be the ultimate fulfillment and pleasure, many people have bought into the lie that sex is the ultimate in fulfillment and pleasure, and they ignore God's standards for sex in order to pursue that. In other words, they've elevated sex to a place where it is now above God, of more value than God, of greater significance than God, of greater pleasure than God. God, money is certainly an idol in our society. When you look to money as that which gives us security and meets our needs, it has become an idol. You see, some people not only acknowledge that we need money, okay? We, we all understand money is necessary to buy food and pay bills. We get that. But is money what we depend on for our security and well-being. Do this. No. No. God is the giver of every good gift. God is the one who supplies our every need according to his abundance, including the money we receive is supplied by God. We look at it as a gift God has given us, but it must never take the place of God. We must never see money as that thing which is our security. Here's the bottom line. What's an idol? What's a false god? Anything that you value, anything that you treasure more than God, anything that you love, more than God 
Anything that you prioritize over God. You see, when you value something more than God, when you love something more than God, when you, when you prioritize something more than God, you are treating that thing as if it were God. If you with me, do this. And anytime you treat something else as if it were God, you have bowed to an idol. And you and I know there is constant pressure, pressure from our society to bow to these idols. See, because society would tell you that money is where real security is. Society would tell you that, that sexual perversion and immorality are good and you should embrace them and ignore what God says. Elevate perversity over God. Society would tell you Pursue whatever makes you happy. Ignore God. See, basically it comes down to this. Society pushes you and I to worship self, whatever self wants, to worship sin and the things of earth. That's what society does. Our significance comes from having the right job, wearing the right clothes, having a certain amount of money, living in a certain kind of place. You name it. The society would say to us, self and sin and the pleasures of earth and the things of earth, these are the things we should trust in. These are the things we should depend on. These are the things we should pledge our allegiance to. And that's the reality of the, the world we live in. But what, uh, what is the way Christians should respond? Well, here it is very simply. God's people trust him and refuse to worship false gods. God's people must trust him and refuse to worship false gods. Well, among that throng of people who bowed down to the statue, golden image, there were some Jews, three, who had been taken captive We've already mentioned them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were, brought to, they were brought from Jerusalem to Babylon. But they had been raised children of God. They knew the commandments very well. And they knew that to bow down to this image would be a great sin. What would they do? Look at verse 8. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. What did God's children do when pressured, even with their life, to bow to the golden image? They refused. Of course, you can imagine this doesn't sit very well with the king, Remember the consequences he threatened. This statue is basically an image of the king, and what they did was basically saying to the king, we won't bow to you, and we know what he said he would do. Look at verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king, Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psalter, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will be immediately cast into the midst of a fire, uh, of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you? out of my hands and there's the issue right there here's the issue when it comes to Christians people of God being pressured to worship false gods 
would God's people trust that he could deliver them or would they give in to the pressure and bow? That was the king's question. What God can deliver you from my hand? Would they trust God or give in to the pressure to bow? Look at verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. They made their position 100% clear in verse 18 we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up the issue here is trust and even king nebuchadnezzar said it himself in verse uh, 28 look at it This is after God delivered them from the fire. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, watch this, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own. That's what the king said. They trusted their God. They were willing to violate the king's command. They were willing to say, we will not bow because they trusted God. And that's exactly what you see in verse 17 and 18. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us, but even if he does not, we will not bow. Here's what they're saying. God will deliver us from death or through death. You with me? God will deliver us from your hand or he will deliver us through your hand. They trusted God. Their commitment is seen very clearly in what the king said in verse 28. We will not serve or worship any God except our own God. To this very day, In Muslim countries, Christians who refuse to convert to Muslim are executed. Do you know that? Every day, all over the world. In countries that are run by extreme Muslims, Christians are executed, sometimes beheaded, sometimes shot. Sometimes they have permacord wrapped around their necks and their heads are blown off. Why? Because they refuse to bow to Allah. They said, our God can deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow. So you and I, whose the pressure on us is much less than it is for those people, we must refuse to worship money. We must refuse to buy into the world's lie that money is where our security lies, that money is what we depend on, that money is what meets our needs. We must say, I will not bow to the idol of money. We must refuse to worship sex, trusting that the ultimate fulfillment comes in God and who he is and what he gives. And this is especially pertinent for those who are outside of marriage. As a Christian, you have to trust that the ultimate fulfillment is not the pursuit of your sexual desires outside of God's will. You have to trust that He is your ultimate pleasure and that those gifts will be given in their time. We have to refuse to worship sports. And you know what this amounts to? This, the issue is really not for the kids. It's more for the parents than it really is the kids. 
Parents, you have to refuse to bow to the idol of sports, and you have to trust that God knows what is best for my child more so than I do. That, that God is more important than that college scholarship that they might get because they played travel ball. You see, our insistence to serve God and God alone may result in threats and consequences. It did for the three Hebrew children. In our world today, it's possible that because you refuse to bow to whatever idol your company is pushing, you may lose your job because you refuse to compromise your convictions. It may cost you a relationship with somebody you're close to because you won't bow to an idol. You refuse to put God in second place. It may cost you people who have been your friends all your life because they pressure you to give in on some things that you can't give in on because of you worship Christ and Him alone. It may lead to great insults. It, it, and listen, the day may come when the government persecution comes on us because we fail to bow to the government. I don't know that I ever thought that would be a reality in America, but it is a very real possibility that you and I are going to be pressured more and more and more to bow to the government. So what do we do? We say God is able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we will not. Prison is an option. Idolatry, not an option. Unemployment is an option. Idolatry is not an option. Losing all my friends is an option. Idolatry is not an option. Having my family turn against me is an option. Idolatry is not an option for the Christian there is no other option. We worship God and God alone. And here's the greatest part of this story. God delivers his people and glorifies his great name. I want you to look at verse 19. Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath. His facial expression was altered towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, their other clothes, were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. For this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of fire slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste. He said to his high officials, Was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Like a son of the gods. Who is, who is this fourth man? This fourth man, I believe, is the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus. In other words, this is Christ before he became human. I believe the text is right. He is a son of God, walking in the fire. And this is important for you and I to remember because for you and I, where does our deliverance lie? When we're pressured to give in and worship those things which are not God, where does our deliverance lie? It lies in who Jesus is. It lies in the fact that Jesus came to earth, lived a perfect life, died in our place on the cross, and rose again from the dead. Our deliverance lies in Christ. When our trust is in him, he will deliver us, whether from death or through death. Christ is our deliverance. Now look at verse 26. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire. He responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God. Come here. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their heads singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. Deliverance. But you and I know, don't we, that God doesn't always deliver from death. Sometimes he delivers through death. Think about all those apostles, the, the original 12 apostles. We know for sure that at least 11 of them were executed by the Roman government, by the state. In, in early Christian centuries, many, 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 many Christians were executed by emperors like Nero. This very day, Christians are suffering greatly in China and in many Muslim countries. These Christians who give their life, they receive the ultimate deliverance. They see Jesus. When they refuse to bow, the ultimate deliverance comes. You, you remember the story of Stephen in Acts chapter 7? Stephen is the first Christian in the church, in the early church in Acts, is to, to be martyred, to be stoned. I want to read you two verses that come from that story. This is what it says about Stephen in Acts 7, verses 55 and 59. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he died. Gazing into the face of Jesus, he was delivered, not from death, but through death. And there's something else we need to notice. God not only delivers his people, but he glorifies his great name. When you and I refuse to bow to the idols of this world, God's name is glorified. I want you to see something. You see it first in verse 26. You see, Nebuchadnezzar refers to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as the Most High God. Now, it doesn't mean he believed he was the only God. It believes he was the God who was above all others. You see it again in verse 29. This is Nebuchadnezzar speaking. Therefore, I make a decree that any people or nation or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, their houses reduced to a total rubbish heap, inasmuch as there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. And look at chapter 4, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all the people, nations, men of every language that live on the earth, May your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs. How mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. Listen, God has used a pagan king to bring glory to his great name in the midst of a pagan country. When three men refuse to bow to false gods, refuse to idolize false gods, refuse to elevate anything above the true God, ultimately God was glorified. Listen, I need you to know that no matter what the end, the, the end result is, when you refuse to bow to the idols of this world, it brings glory to God. I want to try to bring all this into focus for us. When God's people are pressured to worship false gods, they refuse, trusting he will deliver them and glorify his great name. You remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil? It's recorded in Luke chapter 4. One of the, one of the places is Luke 4. He had been fasting 40 days and 40 nights, and the devil came after him. 
one of those particular temptations, the devil said to Jesus, look at the kingdoms of the earth. I'll give them all to you if you will bow down and worship me. What did Jesus do? What did he say? And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. How did Jesus respond to the pressure from Satan himself to worship another? You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve, which is a quote from Deuteronomy. Luke chapter 4, verse 8. You do understand that all pressure, all temptation to bow to one other than God is from the devil. Listen, I don't care if it's your mother who is tempting you to idolize money. It's from Satan. How do we respond to the pressure from the enemy to worship false gods? We respond the exact same way Jesus did. Let me tell you what you need to do. You need to take your Bible. You need to open to Luke chapter 4, verse 8. You need to highlight that verse in the brightest color you can find, crayon, ink pen, whatever you have. You need to highlight that in the brightest color you have. You need to put you something there. And you need to go back to that verse and you need to read it and read it and memorize it until it is so firmly fixed in your mind that it is there all the time. And here's why that's important. Because you're going to be pressured from day to day to make other things more important than God, to elevate other things to a priority status above God. You're going to be pressured to give your love and adoration to some things more than God. You're going to be pressured to seek fulfillment and pleasure and satisfaction in places other than God. And when you are, you need to have this ready. I will worship the Lord my God, and Him only will I serve. Listen, there's always going to be pressure. There's always going to be pressure to put other things before God, to put more value on things than you do, God. But as Christians, we must firmly refuse. It don't matter the threats. It doesn't matter the consequences. We must never bow to the idols of the world. Luke chapter 4, verse 8 should be our instinctive reply should be instinct. I will worship the Lord my God and him only will I serve. Because you know what? The world's going to play its music and they're going to wait for you to bow. And when you don't, you're going to be targeted. But listen, you don't wait until that moment comes to decide what you're going to do. Don't wait until the music plays and the world looks on waiting for you to bow. Don't wait till then to make a decision about how you're going to respond. You need to decide now that you're going to look the world in the eye and say, do to me what you will, but I will not bow to your idol.